It's now my great pleasure to introduce the distinguished presenters of our next session, Dr. Jack Taunton and Alison Hoons. Jack Taunton needs little introduction um, to many of us, and he's a really a celebrity in the world of sports medicine, so I'm very honored to be introducing Jack. Amongst his many achievements and roles, he is the co-founder of the Alan McGavin Sports Medicine Center at UBC, a co-founder of Sport Med BC, a past president of the Sports Medicine Council of Canada, now you know why I have notes, um, and, in, and an inductee in the BC Ho Sports Hall of Fame. He's also currently a professor emeritus in the Faculty of Medicine at UBC. Alison Hoons has the kind of job, many of you I know uh, know Alison, but Alison has the kind of job title that, that kind of generates conversation at dinner parties. She's the physical therapy knowledge broker in a unique partnership that has her reporting to many partners, including PABC, UBC, and the research institutes of Providence Healthcare and Vancouver Coastal Health. She's also the research education and practice coordinator for physiotherapy at Providence Healthcare. So I think we can look forward to a really interesting session from both these uh, em prominent speakers. Um, Alison and Jack have some profound advice for us all, move more and sit less. And I realize we're all just sitting here, but anyway. <laughs> and so here up first is Jack, followed by Alison to explain why. to move to the back of the room to uh, meet with Marie for a moment. Well, it's an honor to be invited to, uh, and to see so many friends from such a long time. And following along with your um, theme of moving for life, get up and get moving uh, is a, an important uh, theme now, who has, uh, if, can you change the slide? Somebody's walked off with the uh, slide uh, changer. Uh, it's right here. Here we are. Thank you, it's hidden. I just can't bend over. Now, going through the ages, the young, uh, Heather McKay, the director of now Hip Health, formerly of kinesiology, uh, showed that bone, den bone density uh, uh, is uh, in the, in the uh, young uh, with a study that she did uh, with uh, elementary school children uh, can simply be improved by bouncing at the bell. So the students, uh, uh, every time the bell would ring, they would get up from their desk and bounce. And that was significant enough to improve their bone density at a very critical age where you're laying down bone mass. The act of young, cardiovascular and pulmonary health improves in those that are active as compared to those that are unactive, decreases risk factors later in life for cardiovascular disease. It's been shown to increase muscle and uh, strength increases. These children, uh, as they continue with this, demonstrate better balance. And uh, for those of us uh, that uh, uh, see a lot of uh, players that are involved in stop, start, change direction, better knee strength, the incidence of ACL tear uh, decreases. And later in life, these individuals that are the active young have a decrease in osteoarthritis. But if not, inactivity, and that's what Alice and I will, and Alison particularly, will be uh, uh, exploring. It's the old use it or lose it. In the brain, uh, uh, research has shown the early onset of dementia. Uh, if not in activity, that can lead to chronic disease, increase in type 2 diabetes, hypertension, certainly coronary artery disease, even peripheral vascular disease, and certainly obesity. In terms of bone, with, with the reduced bone density with inactivity, the biggest problems that you face in a clinical practice with that individual coming in with acute lumbar pain is do they have a compression fracture of the lumbar spine? And uh, a significant increase, if you work in the emergency ward, a significant increase in distal wrist fractures. And associated with this is a loss of articular cartilage with inactivity. 
And with that, obviously osteoarthritis in the patients that you see, knee, hip, and the lumbar spine. In terms of cancer, when we study a running population, and this could be a walking population, but the study is prim prim primarily in terms of running, they have a lower incidence of both breast and particularly colon cancer. And in terms of rehabilitation, exercise is so critical. And that's why uh, we have uh, been very fortunate to get a, a million dollar donation for our new Alan McGavin Sports Medicine Center with groundbreaking June the 1st, finally. And uh, we have uh, had a donation from the Darlene and Jack Poole Foundation for an expansion of Don McKenzie's uh, Breast in a Boat program, uh, but to enhance uh, with pancreatic, uh, colon, and uh, prostate cancer uh, in terms of exercise itself. Within it. So far, the studies have uh, shown an increase not only in quality of life, but also survival. Exercise for life, a recent study that I'm sure many of you have seen 20 minutes of regular fast walking. Only 20 minutes. We don't have to be out for an hour, but 20 minutes reduces all death, all death by 30%. And so when you're giving that message to your patients, it's not that they have to join the Sun Run Clinic or the Marathon Clinic to get the benefits, but it's just 20 minutes. No exercise can lead to a loss of independence, a loss of strength and balance. And with that, the, the basic uh, uh, activities uh, that the seniors, uh, uh, difficulty getting up from a chair, from a toilet seat, difficulty climbing uh, uh, stairs and getting up from chairs, and difficulty simply carrying groceries and then putting them away. Without regular exercise, we know there's a loss of balance. And that leads to falls and fractures in the hip health program that uh, Heather McKay has uh, been doing a lot of investigation in, in this. And one of the biggest factors uh, is poor strength. Poor strength in the core, hip abduction, your hip flexors, quads, and hamstrings. Without regular exercise, this can also lead to hormonal changes. And for the female, premature menopause. For males, gonadal failure. And it's only been recently recognized in terms of, with uh, inactivity, gonadal failure with a loss of testosterone. And with that, osteoporosis. Fairly significant mood changes that most people don't realize with a loss of testosterone. And a loss of muscle bulk and strength. So, the message, get up and get moving before you end up running for your life. Thank you. Okay, talk about a tough job with a tough act to follow there. Thank you so much, Jack. Um, I have just 15 minutes to share with you an impressive body of work undertaken by 130 very impressive people in this province. So here goes. Firstly, Jack has laid the foundation for why movement is so important. But this slide gives me a little extra perspective on the relative danger of that. Why are we so scared of sharks? <laughs> and why are we not terrified of sitting on our butts in chairs? By the way, there are some free chairs up front for the people who are standing at the side. Even if you reach that 150 minutes of moderate to vigorous exercise every week, there's ample literature to show that sitting alone, even if you're reaching those uh, exercise guidelines, is associated is an independent risk factor for increased mortality. In fact, a recent study has shown that sitting for six hours will negate the effects of 60 minutes of exercise. 
So what's the good news? Well, as Jack has alluded to, and I mean, that's not a problem for people in this room. People in this room in, in, in our jobs, we're up and moving all the time. It's the messaging that we need to share with our colleagues, it, to share with our patients, etc. So what's the good news? Well, if you look at that yellow line there, that's the normal progression of disease incidence with age of onset. Okay, so as you can see, around 60 years of age, that's where there's a little bit of uh, the first uh, onset of disease incidence. If you exercise, you can delay, you can move that curve down and to the right by keeping physically active. And the worst combination is being sedentary and obese. So why is this so difficult? If we know that it's good for us, and in fact, it's not good to be doing the reverse. And there, it's freely accessible in many ways. We can access walking seven days a week, 24 hours a day. And as Jack has said, 20 minutes alone has been shown to be sufficient for those benefits. But why is it to so tough? Well, let's look at our, our chronic disease population. It's not just access, they're carrying a lot of other burdens that make it difficult for them to access that. So is it good enough for us as physical therapists and for other healthcare providers simply to prescribe exercise? There was a recent article in the Canadian Medical Association Journal looking at this, and it's, it's now an accepted standard that simply prescribing exercise is insufficient. Even if we know the number of reps, even if we know the dose, even if we know the intensity, the frequency, the duration, we need to be doing more to support people, particularly those with chronic disease, to move more and sit less. In fact, it needs to be tailored. So, what is this all about? This project is called Move More, Sit Less. In 2014, we put out a call for new knowledge broker projects. Uh, that was when my hair wasn't gray. And uh, there were four that were submitted, and the steering committee selected this particular project. What, we were, what it was driven from was a recognition of the burden that both healthcare providers and persons living with chronic disease experience in trying to get guidance on how much they should be doing, on how much physical activity. Healthcare providers told us that there was way too much information available. The information was all over the place. And how could they know whether that information was credible or not? How would they sort through it? Persons with chronic disease told us the same thing. There's too much. It's all over the place. How do they know it's any good? And also, they told us, how do I know it's relevant to me? How do I know that it's relevant for my particular given situation? So we put together a team and our project, Move More, Sit Less, a toolkit to support healthy activity in chronic disease. So who's involved in this project? Well, you see me standing here, but I am a paltry representation of 130 people that are working on this project in this province and beyond. There's a core committee of eight individuals that represent varying uh, areas of practice in physical therapy, the physical activity line of uh, British Columbia. We have 97 people in the working groups, patients, clinicians, researchers all over the province. We have an advisory committee of 28 researchers and people from the uh, BC Parks and Recreation and patient representatives. And in those working groups, we have eight different working groups based on the World Health Organization categorizations of different um, chronic diseases. But I want to particularly point out our patient partners on this project. We have 28 patient partners, and we know by experience that it's not good enough to just ask patients to provide input on something that you draft, that they need to be a part of co-developing what you're developing. And our, because you can build something, you can build anything you want, but is it gonna be used? Okay, and I think this picture really captures that. 
We also have a number of external partners and way too many to fit on this slide. We have patient organizations that represent heart and stroke, um, Parkinson's disease, Osteoporosis Canada, you name it. You think of a, a patient group, they're involved in this project, as well as the others indicated on this slide. So what did we want to put in this toolkit to support moving more and sitting less? Tools to help screen, assess, guide and support prescription, but also to support monitoring it, addressing barriers, encouraging or enhancing adherence, how to select uh, equipment and links to community resources. So how did we do that? Well, I believe in the KISS principle. I try to keep the structure as simple as possible. So baseline surveys, we had to establish what the current standard was and what people really were searching for, both healthcare providers and patients. We then got the working groups to identify, catalog, and evaluate existing resources in all the different disease categories. Once those resources were evaluated, they were then submitted to an advisory committee member of researchers to make sure that those resources were consistent and in synchrony with the evidence. They're then loaded onto a website, and then we will disseminate and implement. So what did we learn from our surveys? Well, 447 of uh, healthcare providers, not just PTs, we had OTs, we had nurses, we had exercise specialists, we had physicians. Um, a number of uh, 447 people responded to our survey and look at what they told us that they were most comfortable, what patient groups they were most comfortable in prescribing exercise and least comfortable. I think the limitations are not a surprise to anybody in this room. We can all relate to what the barriers are for us in prescribing. When we then did our survey with the chronic persons living with chronic disease, we got 454 responses. 64% of those patients told us that they were either less or much less physically active than before they got their chronic health condition. And they were spending more than five hours a day 50% more than five hours a day sedentary. Most patients that respondents told us that they were living with three chronic diseases. And we know that. How do you know which, which uh, guidelines you should be following when somebody's living with multiple chronic diseases? Patients also told us that they wanted information primarily about what they could do at home they wanted professionals to tell them what advice on safe and effective exercise, but also appropriateness, how much they should do, and they wanted information on technologies to help. 71% of them had smartphones. Wow, was this ever an opportunity that we could take advantage of in designing the toolkit? They told us what they wanted and how they wanted it. Then the working groups went through, they did their work, they identified all the existing resources from every website, from YouTube, from, I can't even begin to list the number of resources that people found. And then they cataloged each of them. And then within each working group, two members independently evaluated each resource with a structured tool and then if the difference in scores was greater than 20%, a third reviewer then evaluated it. Based on those scores, both for the healthcare provider and patient uh, resources, we then came up, and this is an example of the tool that we use to, this is a screenshot of the tool that we use to evaluate the patient uh, eva uh, education materials. This is a really good tool if you're doing something in your clinic and you're deciding, is this a good tool for patients? It's a wonderful way of reviewing it. So then we submitted it to our advisory committee members to ensure that it was in synchrony with the evidence. And what we're ending up with in the toolkit is the best of the best. Okay, not 500 resources, but the best of the best. Then we met with our IT colleagues. And do I look like a website designer? Hardly. So we had to get expertise in helping us to design this website. 
You'll notice that the core committee is walking the talk here. We are standing during our committee meeting to design the website. As we designed the website, we took that design back to our working groups and said, does this work? We asked patients, does this work? This is just a rough outline. You'll see that there will be a search box so that you can search. You won't have to click through a number of links. There'll be some key messages. There'll be an entry portal for healthcare providers and an entry portal for patients with chronic diseases. And guess what? Our patients, our surveys told us, we want to be able to see what each other is getting. It will be open to both, okay? Then if you click on that portal, the next layer down will take you into each of those working group categories for chronic disease. When we took this template back to our working groups, the patients told us, drop the term oncology, use cancer, drop the term renal, use kidney. We got lots of information by co-developing this rather than developing it in isolation. But most importantly, they told us, how can we help to make this happen? Don't just tell us what to do, but how to support us in doing that. So I'm meeting with a, a, one of our experts in behavior change, who's a part of the advisory committee, and we'll have a part of the website that's dedicated to helping it happen. Looking at screening for risk factors, current physical activity assessment, motivational change and ready stages of change, tools to help like prescription pads and tracking tools and behavior change techniques. And then we're gonna get it out there. And we have commitment from so many different organizations that are so excited by this project because it has been a missing link for many. So Exercises Medicine Canada in particular, Physiopedia, uh, British Journal of Sports Medicine, they're all committed. And we know that these avenues have worked because of the 23 different knowledge broker resources that have been developed over the six years. We've had 164,000 downloads of our resources, provincially, nationally, and internationally. So, all of those of you in this room who are partic participating in this project, please stand up. Yep. Thank you all. So this is our chance to make physical activity great again. And in line with that, first of all, I want to thank Jack for, um, for coming and sharing uh, his expertise with us this morning and setting the stage for us on why movement is so important and now listening to your feedback from uh, previous uh, uh, forums that we've had from previous practice forums you told us you wanted to move more during these practice forums it's your turn so i'm going to ask the members of the total joint arthroplasty outcome measures team who are wearing yellow caps and workers jackets to make their way throughout the room here and we're going to use this opportunity to share with you some really good news about the total joint arthroplasty and outcome measures toolkit so those of you that are aware of this six and a half years in development over 30 people being a part of the chart, ARDIT, the focus groups, the Delphi project, the KT activities. We've finished up with 12 different outcome measures, self-report and performance for patients with total knee or total hip arthroplasty. Across the continuum of care from pre-op right to the community with one page summaries, discharge letters, templates, and we're happy to report that the online learning modules are now ready as well. So if you want to access these, the entire toolkit is available for free on both the PABC website as well as the UBC website. And you can register for access, free ongoing access to these modules by clicking on this link.